Hi everyone and welcome to the Changing Tides podcast. In each episode, we invite guests to have honest conversations about their mental health journeys with the goal of destigmatizing mental health within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Due to the nature of the podcast, we'll be discussing a variety of mental health topics and possibly triggering experiences. While we and the majority of our guests are not trained professionals, we encourage you to practice self-care while listening and seek professional guidance if you or a loved one is in need of support. With that said, let's start the episode. Hello, my name is Kevin Charles Kizuchi, and I describe my mental health journey as going to a raging party, drinking till you pass out, and then finally being woken up with a smack. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Changing Tides podcast. My name is Matthew Nomura and I am the host of this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. I was reached out to this guest um, just through him wanting to be on the podcast. He says just straightforward, hey, how do I get on the show? And I let him know, like, let's talk a little bit. Let me hear a little bit more about your story. And then a week later, we're here and we just re- finished the interview. So it was really great to get to know this guy and to hear about his stories. And I, I touched on it in the episode or in the interview, but it's so promising to know that there's so many folks that are younger who are passionate about Little Tokyo and passionate about the JA community. I think when I first got hired at Little Tokyo Service Center, I was thinking to myself, like, I don't know of many folks who are, like, I don't know who's going to take over LTSC or other Little Tokyo initiatives once the generations above us are gone. But then I meet people like today's guest, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a future leader in the community and i've met so many others like that too and i'm really i'm really optimistic about the future of little tokyo so with that said uh, i'm really excited for you to listen to this interview it was a fun one for me uh, i'll be on his podcast uh tomorrow to record let me give you this interview that i had with kevin kevin my man thank you so much for being on the podcast um we had just a couple conversations prior to but uh, I know that you have a very interesting story and I want to get into that. But first, I got to understand the description of this journey. So if you could walk me through this party, what kind of party this was, what yeah. kind of smack this was, I just want to hear yeah. about it. Yeah, no. So like, I guess the way I describe it isn't like normal people would uh, in terms of like their kind of like journey and stuff. But I think like, especially in college and in kind of like dealing with kind of being like a little bit depressed um kind of like being trapped in my own career path I just decided to you know distract myself and to just kind of like you know go out to all the like these parties or just like see how wasted I could get or kind of like you know things overindulging in certain aspects of life and that was just majorly kind of carrying on for a while of just not really addressing um my mental health and kind of like what was really at the bottom of it and kind of like as I continued on you know you can only uh carry that so long before you know it wears you down and that's kind of like me like like kind of like passing out and kind of like like not being able to keep up with like you know my studies my like grades are failing you know just lack of taking care of myself my body wasn't like adjusting. I was sleeping really late. And I just had this point in time where like, it just hit me. Like I literally slapped myself in terms of like, Hey, I need to get together. Mm -hmm. Like no one's going to help me in terms of like, at least figuring out what's wrong with me or getting me out of this funk. You know, Mm -hmm. it was like a different time where, you know, I had to realize myself, especially in my situation is just like, Hey, I'm the only one who can help me, you know, and I need to go either, you know, change my actions and kind of like really reinvent who I am because like, I don't like where I'm at now. And that's kind of like the real, like, um, like, um, ice bucket challenge of just like realizing like, Hey, like I I need to make a change, a drastic one or else it's not going to be good for me. And I'm just going to keep declining 
and kind of like being um, antisocial, um, not wanting to go to class, grades are failing, and just overall not being an upright citizen. So, mm. so this description turns out to be very literal at the same time, not just yeah. like a metaphor for their journey, like very literal. Yeah. So, like, oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Just, I mean, it, it's, it's literal in the sense of like, Hey, like, you know, it's a jarring moment, but I think it's a good metaphor because I think we've, I, I guess I'm not speaking for everyone, but like most people have kind of gone through that process where it's like, Hey, I'm just like not focusing enough. I need to like really get back to like what I'm about. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess like when you paint it, in a picture now it's very clear that that's like the start of the mental health journey but when did you realize that these feelings and this this need to turn things around was truly like mental health like when did you come to realize that was mental health um i kind of like realized well there's a situation that happened to me where like i was feeling like trapped in my like major of like chemical engineering because it was like super hard um I think I just finished like a sophomore class and like 50% of the class like dropped out. Mm -hmm. It went from like 60 people down to 30. Like no one was getting um, passing grades. We were just barely meeting the curve. And I was trudging through homework and tests and labs and I didn't have a social life. I wasn't able to go to the gym frequently. I wasn't eating properly. And I kind of had this dinner with like my, my mom and my dad and my grandma and I was like hey like I'm not really liking my major can I change it to like studio art and they're like why do you want to change it to studio art and I was like well I really like to to draw and like paint and then my father tells me he's like you're not good enough to draw or paint mm. as a profession and that kind of really messed me up like like for a long time and kind of sent me even more into like a depressive spiral of like I mean, I'm not good enough. I'm not like, you know, capable of doing anything rather than explaining to me like, Hey, you know, maybe grind this out and kind of finish this and then figure out after, but he just told me I wasn't good enough. And so from that point, it kind of like put me in like this, like weird depressive state where I kind of like started the whole sequence that I discussed in the first sentence. Um, but I, after that, I kind of needed to like, you know, reassess myself. So I started like um, after like kind of realizing like, I need to get out of this funk or can I go, you know, started reading a lot more self-help books, started like eating better, treating my diet better, exercise, just things like that. And I mean, obviously I kind of used all my friends as therapists because at the time, um, this is like 2010, 2011, when I'm in college, uh, sophomore, junior year and it mental health and taking care of yourself isn't as prevalent as it is today so mm -hmm. no, not everyone had like a therapist that they could recommend you or even kind of like did you think to go to you know the on-campus therapist it was more just like I uh, just you know just stick it out man you know just mm -hmm. man up you know just just uh you know just just handle it you know you'll 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 get through it and eventually I did but I did read a lot and I did like self analyze myself a lot and try to figure out like where all this stems from so I kind of like figured out my mental health a little bit on my own but I definitely had the tools and techniques of all like the teachers and kind of authors of all these books you know habits like meditation uh like all these kind of other things that really kind of like helped me on the right path you know, mm -hmm. I didn't do it alone, but at the time I didn't have anyone to just, you know, kind of guide me such as like a therapist. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so among all these books and all everything that you read and everything that you did, what was kind what were some of your like first steps in actually putting this into your lifestyle? Like how, like what were your, how did you get started? Um, so like one of, one of like, I, I don't really recall like which book it kind of was, but it was talking about how you spend all your time with yourself. So why not be kind to yourself instead of like talking yourself down mm -hmm. or kind of being so hurtful or critical of yourself and try to like, you know, really 
build up your confidence. And from there, I kind of like thought like, oh, that's, that's a, that's a pretty good start. And then I kind of got into this idea of like, kind of like nihilism and where like nothing really matters and stuff like that. But there's also a sense of like absurdist nihilism where it's like, because nothing matters, whatever you care about should matter the most Hmm. in a sense that like, you know, if you care about your art, that should be your main focus. If you care about your family, that should also be your main focus. And that like, you know, we're kind of like this tiny little speck in the universe. Um, So that also really like helped um, uplift the burden off my shoulders of like, like being like, oh, like I'm, I'm carrying all the weight of like, you know, the, the, the pride of my family or kind of the responsibility of being the first son or kind of, you know, just um, achieving and striving, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like, it's a lot to like handle and a lot of pressure, but I, I think as soon as I kind of learned that, I was like, oh, like, you know, it's, it's not that bad. Everyone's figuring it out as they go. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think I, I, think I kind of came across a similar thing, but I, I, I refer to it as like existentialism. Yes. Where I was like, well, if I might as well do what I enjoy and what makes me feel good. And the mm-hmm. majority of those things are, are positive. So I, I might as well push forward with those if, if, I, if I could make myself happy and also help the people immediately around me, yeah. then like that's enough. And it, even if it's not like this lasting impact thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know, so like you spoke on this, these standards that your parents had, which is a very mm-hmm. AAPI thing, yeah. you know, especially not exploring the arts. But yeah. I know that you are super passionate, <clears throat> excuse me, super passionate about the JA community. Yes. So I'd love to kind of know like what got you involved with the little Tokyo community. So like the reason why I kind of got really involved in the JA community is one part is my grandma was super involved. She's uh she's a co-owner of Little Tokyo Leasing and Sales, which had a um a business in Little Tokyo for like 35 years. And she's done everything. She's been president of Nisei Week. She's been you know, on several boards, all these other things. And so that was always in like the back of my head. Um, But I guess another situation of kind of like me being like depressed was that I was finishing up this project, an NFT project that didn't kind of pan out as planned. And because of that, I thought like, you know, is it me? Am I worthless? Am I not like able to like manage people in this project? And so because of that, I like kind of, I just needed to leave. And I, I left to New York to do this, um, uh, to go to this Murakami party that was I was invited of because of an NFT. And I started just like networking and kind of mingling with people. And then that helped me realize like the talent that I had and that it wasn't me. It wasn't, it was just like, you know, another member of the group or the business that ultimately made it turn sour. And because of that, I kind of, I told my friend Ken on the flight home that like, hey, I'm going to make, I'm going to make changes in somewhere that I can like, you know, I have at least a foothold and that's in like little Tokyo because my grandma has um, kind of like connections there. And then also I kind of grew up there and I was just thinking about like, you know, I was like, what if we throw like, you know, a music festival you know, what if we like, you know, do something that like, like involves like the arts, you know, because like, ever like how, how you're phrasing everyone kind of pushes us to be lawyers and like, I don't know, engineers and all this other stuff. So my friend was like, oh, what would you call the festival? And I was like, we'll call the festival, we can't all be doctors, you know, because that's always pressed on us. Like, hey, like, you know, like, how, how are you working towards like you know being a doctor i know you're in bio and it's always just like a thing that like looms over asian americans is that sense of like hey like you need to be you need to be this profession you know you need to bring pride or you need to bring prestige to the family you know it's funny it's like it's like like ronnie chang says he's like it's you know it's like the prestige the money the connections but the hardest people that you can send to a doctor are your Asian parents. You know, you just, they can never go, but they want you to be a doctor for all like the wrong reasons. And I mean, 
that's only from like my perspective and stuff but because of that like it, it's always like a funny thought that like oh like you know why not put on this like art and entertainment fest that's kind of behind that like guys and then I thought I was like oh little Tokyo would be perfect for that in terms of like putting it together and kind of like reaching out to the organizations and stuff like that because if you think about it we have a large amount of event space in terms of like Chinatown or like Koreatown and all these other things that like you know we should be the ones to kind of like make that uh change in the world so, you know, I know that this kind of this realization or this inspiration to get super involved with the community uh -huh. came at kind of a low point, right? Yeah. It was among all this other stuff. So, so what role, like how, how did this impact your mood or your mental health when you came across this inspiration? Um, I think it like, it finally with each like kind of like interaction I had, it gave me like positive reinforcement that like it that like I am good at what I do and kind of like reinforce my confidence of like hey navigating the space and kind of being somewhat of a leader um to to kind of like harness that and like I guess you know it took kind of like it, it kind of took that low point to kind of also realize like hey like I'm pretty sure a lot of other people feel the same way you know, especially coming out of the pandemic of not seeing all their friends and stuff like that, that like, you know, my, I've always found that like my outlook on life isn't always just unique to me, you know, that like, there's probably other people who embrace it. So it's kind of, it was kind of just a reason to see like, oh, who's, who's out there, you know, sending like a radio signal out to space and just being like, oh, who, who else feels the same way, you know, and kind of like, kind of uh just seeing who else out in the community would be willing to help so i know that you know just to play devil's advocate sure let's say like i were to hear what you just said or what you wanted to do and i'm like well what's wrong with nisei week what's wrong with sake on the rocks yeah like what like why did you decide to take an approach of say a music festival um i just kind of well since being in like the J space i'm aware of like all of like the nisei week events of all the J events and i've i've actually participated and been at a lot of them uh my grandma likes to brag that i was in a rolls royce uh for like a nisei week riding when i was like four years old you know with <laughs> uh -huh. the grand marshal and stuff like that and i'm like that's great so it has a lot of lineage has a lot of prestige but i've always I've talked to a lot of people who have participated in Nissan Week and it's just this unmovable event. Mm -hmm. It's set in its ways. It's a standard. It's been here since what, the thirties. There's like almost a hundred Nisei Week queens. Um, so the metaphor I like to use is that Nisei Week is like a bonsai tree and there's no way you're going to make it move or bend to form, you know, the branch that you want. So you kind of got to start with something new. Right. And that's what I, I guess the loose idea that I play with is called like the Shinsei movement and that you start like a new bonsai tree um, because it's kind of funny. I met this bonsai master at the JCC gala event and he was telling me he, it, it takes 15 years for a bonsai tree to start, you know, and to kind of a prosper. So why not kind of like start our own kind of like tree and branch now, you mm -hmm. know, maybe from a clipping of the Nisei wheat tree. Um, that's kind of like the metaphor of it, but then also the reason why I thought like, you know, I wasn't kind of, I mean, I like going to sake on the rocks, but in my, in my youth, they used to have a lot more family events. Nowadays, it's a lot of 21 and over. I don't know if like haunted little Tokyo was 21 and over, but I know sake on the rocks is 21 and over. Um, a lot of different events, like, you know, uh, appeal to that. 20 to 35 age group and then you have like straight out little tokyo which is like a little bit older crowd you're talking like 40 to 55 you know stuff like that but in my day like when i was young and my grandma was the one taking me around there was like the tofu festival families could come they could like you know um not have to plan for a babysitter not figure out how they're going to be back by 9 30 etc etc 
And my mindset is like, if you want to keep the generations going, you kind of have to inspire those kids from like a young age. You have to like build leadership groups that are in high school, early stages of like college, you know, you can't just make it seem like it's a party scene all the time because if that's what it is, then they're only going to come out to party and they're not going to come to kind of like, you know, build something to develop events, to kind of foster um, certain aspects of community. Cause I think the biggest gripe I get about like little Tokyo is like, Oh, all there is is to do there is to either shop, eat or drink, you know, and that it needs something else to like really round it out. Mm. And I don't know, it, it, I've talked to a lot of like, previous leaders like Bill Watanabe and kind of just discussed with him, like, you know, the idea of bringing back uh, the tofu festival um, and kind of like other things. And then I guess for people who don't know what the tofu festival is, it's a, um, a program that Bill Watanabe who created LTSC uh, made in his like heyday where he decided he's like, Oh, he was tired of like these big gala plate, like dinners you know, where people are all donating money and then it's kind of the higher upper echelon of like the J community. So instead he decided to put on the Tofu Festival, which kind of in its height in 2007 was like the biggest festival in Southern California. 40,000 people were kind of heading to Little Tokyo to celebrate. And the unique thing about tofu and food in general is that like, it's kind of, it's, it's more, it, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of um, all encompassing hmm. because, you know, almost it's social, all, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's historical. It's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, it's food culture. So like yeah. it, it, it crosses borders and like, you know, and at the time, like you, you watch like uh, um, him being interviewed. Uh, I forget by who, but like, basically they're like, Oh, like what, what's tofu like people weren't even sure of it but nowadays it's like you have so many different varieties of tofu you have so many different varieties of soy protein mm -hmm. things like that it's like it's um it, it crosses cultures and you know for asian americans it's like a staple food that you know you can you can always go back to whether it's mapo tofu soon tofu things like that you know and i think that's like a real gateway stepping stone for like our culture is just our food you know, it's so easy to get a hold of. So I think that's like kind of the reason why like I'm pushing for my ideas is just like, you know, we we have enough 21 and over events. Nisei Week isn't going to change, but I do respect it for what it's done. And, you know, my hopes are that we can create events, you know, at least once a month, you know, hmm. to just bring people into Little Tokyo, to share our culture and to like, you know, make it something more than an eating and drinking destination. Totally. And so, so it's, it's, it's interesting because you've presented the idea of a music festival, but uh -huh. then also tofu festival. Yes. So one is like a traditional present the culture, yes. uh, share the culture. The other is like a more modern take. Yeah. So I guess how, how do you see the future of Little Tokyo? Because like how do you honor the past while looking towards the future generations? So I think the way that we honor the past is that um, you kind of utilize like, I guess, like the profits and kind of the avenues of like bringing in people for a musical event or a tofu festival to pay for the traditional stuff. Hmm. I mean, let's be honest, like it's hard to get people to pay to go see Taiko, you mm -hmm. know? To, to like get them into the Aratani to go see Hiroshima unless like that's like your thing you know so one thing that I'm doing is I'm putting a screening on at the Budokan um, of Weathering With You which is anime and it kind of seems really ridiculous to me that Little Tokyo isn't harnessing the power of anime to like pay for all these other things I need you know? to stop you right there because oh. have you seen how many anime stores there are in Little Tokyo? Oh, now? oh you, 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 you want to know something? <laughs> huh. Okay, so on Saturday, I went to Jungle's hentai event, and there was 250 people, like, lined up out the door. Like, you know, it was insane. You know, you don't shake hands with those people. You just bump elbows. I've never like, even heard of that. Really? No, I it, don't. It, it's, 
you you don't know you just just search, just search it on your on your computer oh. make sure you're incognito oh, okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just trust me but the, the point is yeah 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 it's it's very niche uh-huh. and it got people out there to kind of you know just i guess see what it's about and the fact that like you know you have jungle who takes the whole the whole setup of the underground you have so many like uh tokyo pop shops you have like you know just anime curio all around you got to see like what brings in money Hmm. and in my mind is like you take that and then you apply it to the other kind of um events that you want to put on so for instance like my screening i want to like you know like pay or take some of the profits and kind of like apply it to like you know having um better programs for the elderly or paying for you know the youth basketball jerseys stuff like that right so it's giving back but ultimately it keeps cycling in terms of its own program you know a little bit of the proceeds goes to um like i guess you know offering tickets to like such events and things like that because the way i see it is anime is the chicken the chicken cup of noodle that sits on your dorm fridge or the red like ramen packet that you eat as a kid it's like the gateway to like other more refinements of like japanese culture i like to think of anime as like you know like it has all this visual vocabulary because you know all the characters take place in like high school i don't know why but, <laughs> but like everything is just kind of like you know between like their backpacks or between the transport system or the foods that they eat you know how many times have you seen like a studio ghibli film and be like i want to eat that food it looks delicious Mm -hmm. you know and then you go forever searching for that or you watch like food wars right i was up in japan or i was up in uh, san francisco and i was at this um restaurant called benu which is like a three michelin star like fancy like asian restaurant and i was talking to one of the waiters I was like, oh, this is like, this is like food wars. And then, and then I was telling him, I was like, I was like, yeah, I hope my clothes don't explode. And then he just had to leave to go go laugh it off. (laughs) And then I got to talking to him about like these, like, these like pepper buns that like they have in food wars. I was like asking him because they're Taiwanese. I'm like, hey, does the chef who's from Taiwan or one of the chefs from Taiwan, does he know where to get them? And he said to go look in like, you know, um, San Francisco Chinatown. So I went. And I found those buns and then I dropped an order off to the waiter at Bennu mm. being like, Hey, I found it. It's on this menu. Check it out. Mm-hmm. But like, even for me, I saw something in anime and I went to go seek it out. You know, I went to go find out where I could source this, what it was about to taste it and stuff like that. And I can only imagine how other cultures feel about um, that and like being being in little Tokyo, you can go right across the street and get whatever you want. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that's like a real great opportunity that, that can be had. And yeah, I wish Mm -hmm. I had a way to bring it back to mental health, but no, no, you're, you're good. Cause I, I think, you know, I, part of what we like to do here or what I like to do through this podcast is not just talk about, I, th- I think to understand your mental health journey, we have to understand you as a person. Yes. You know, and mm-hmm. I think one part, I mean, this also goes back into the fact that this passion for Little Tokyo was kind of a spark for your mental health as well. Yeah. So I think to hear the passion coming out of you when okay. you're discussing these topics goes yeah. right into it. And yeah. and kind of with that, I, I, I'm curious, you know, when it comes to appreciating our culture because yes. when i was young and we're your fourth gen right uh fifth gen fifth gen yeah so we're yeah. both fifth gen yeah and it's like how it's easy to be wrapped up in being american and True. not japanese american yeah so i know you were involved with little tokyo at a young age but when did you really did was there ever a moment when you were like wait wait my japanese culture is really cool and maybe was there a time where you kind of rejected it so I think, I guess I was like really, really young and kind of like maybe in like the single grades or I mean, maybe like fifth grade or something like that. Yeah, it was probably fifth grade because I was I was going to school and I was wearing like Dragon Ball Z shirts from Miller's uh-huh. Outpost. And people were like, what's that? Like, that's so, that's, uh, that's so like, you know, that's so Asian, blah, blah, blah. And I'm mm-hmm. like, dude, this is cool. 
Like, mm-hmm. have you ever seen this? Like, you, you, you're you obviously uneducated, but I mean, at fifth grade, you know, people pick on you and say things about your mom and just, it's just weird. Right. But, but like, at that point in time, I was like, I was like, oh, like, you know, it's really cool to kind of like embrace this a little bit more. And, you know, I, cause like I'm, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese, but I always kind of really embraced my like Japanese side because there was less Japanese people out there. You know, there's much more Chinese people that I knew who went to, to school with and to be Japanese American, I thought of myself much more unique. You know, that's like the avenue of uniqueness I could really take that was, was like, you know, in my blood. And I think um, at that point in time, I just I just ran with it and was like, hey, like, I'd rather be unique than like everyone else. And I didn't mind being criticized. I didn't mind being like, you know, seen as the weird person because like, I don't know, it's, it's just something to be proud of, especially since I know so much about our history and like my grandma was interned, my great grandpa, grandparents were interned in Gila River and just knowing like when they came out, it's like, hey, you should be American. Don't be mm-hmm. Japanese. Don't speak Japanese. You shouldn't like, you shouldn't even like, you know, enjoy the culture because you might get sec- sent back to Japan. Like everyone was told to just, you know, be American. But I soon realized at an early age that I would never be American. You know, I'm kind of in like, I feel like J people are in this weird limbo of like, you you won't be Japanese, you won't be American. So you kind of try to figure out what like J A means. Mm-hmm. And since like, that's such a muddled definition, it's, you're basically playing to everyone else's like uh, rules. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hard because like, you know, some may, some people have stiffer rules than others. Some may have loose definitions, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point in time, I realized I'm like, well, I can just, I can only do me the best, you know, right. and try to like, not like embarrass my ancestors in any way or form, but kind of like carry the torch how I see fit. Yeah. So when we spoke prior to recording today, mm-hmm. uh, last week, we, we, were touched, we talked a, quite a bit about the internment camps. Yeah. And you mentioned it just now. So I, I wanted to ask you, you know, because in my experiences, I don't think my family's um, generational trauma from the internment camps have been too, super impactful in our lifestyle. Yeah. But I'm wondering for you and your experiences, like, were there... Do you still see the lasting impacts of generational trauma from the camps? I mean, I would say everyone does. It's Mm kind of hard not to. It's this like great stain on like American history in that like, you know, you take U.S. citizens and kind of drive them into these camps and like the desert and stuff like that. You know, and then I guess what really frustrates me is that like um, the way it was handled and treated, because I mean, a lot of like. Japanese people used to own lots of land in Palos Verdes and in San mm-hmm. Francisco. But during that time when they had to move, you know, um, all that was stripped from them. And so speaking from my, my personal history uh, with my great grandparents and my great uncle who knows a lot more than I do, um, they would never talk about it when they were like younger. They would, they would let up on little tiny like snippets here and there. But overall, it's kind of like this um, don't talk about it. It doesn't exist kind of thing, you know, but my uncle once told me a story that's pretty jarring about how my, my great grandfather Michi and his brother Sho were um, I guess defending their father because apparently they had a curfew where at like, I don't know, nine o'clock, all lights had to be out some kind of hour, but they were reaching into one of their produce refrigerators and there was a light on. And so one of the um, air raid marshals came by and arrested them and took them all to jail. And basically they had um, ties with like the Quakers and stuff and they kind of bailed them out the next day. But had it not been for that scenario of knowing those people, who knows what would have happened to them. Right. And then to give more of an extension of their story as they were considered second-class citizens, um, like in their own homes. They were then taken to internment camps, and then 
throughout, like, I guess, throughout internment, um, uh, my great grand uncle, uncle show, and my great grandfather had to see like, you know, their home of Hiroshima get wiped off the face of the earth. And then after that, my uncle show was told like, Oh, to prove your loyalty, you got to join the army where he became, you know, part of the, the 442nd and MIS and even got to like, you know, um, speak with, uh, what is it? Mao Zedong and like all these other things, but like to have all that happen to him and then him land back in America and be like, Oh, tell his kids, like, just, just be American, you know, just kind of assimilate. Mm -hmm. That's, that's crazy. It's like, it's wild to see that sequence of events happen to that, that individual. And then to have him come back and just be like, Oh, just be American. Imagine all these kind of people after that event telling their kids. So I think because of that, I've kind of explained it to a few um, higher ups in the community that like, I believe, you know, it's a generation of people who have lost their confidence, Mm. you know, to being prideful of being like Japanese American to being like, you know, I'm, I'm born of Japanese descent, but like, I also have all these other characteristics and also after internment, you know, you have all these lawyers, doctors, um, high business owners who just couldn't get jobs. So they segue to things that they could do like gardening Mm. or farming or being like uh, produce vendors and stuff like that. So, it kind of almost economically set us behind the whole generation as well. And then imagine those kind of parents raising their kids, you know, in that time of scarcity, in that time of, of kind of like basically like prejudice Mm -hmm. and kind of like having that scarcity, you know, you're, you're going to be conservative. You're not going to take risks at all. You know, so that like kind of like Sansei Yonsei generation doesn't want to take risks, right? They're like, keep your head down, grind away, all all that stuff. And then that kind of perpetuates into the next generation. So I think for like you and I being both Gosei, we're kind of almost out of it, hmm. you know, in a sense that like my parents were like, oh yeah, I mean, for 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 better or most, well, my dad, my dad is second generation um his dad immigrated from China and then he's first American. So that's why he kind of has that mentality of what, why he told me, he's like, Oh, you're not good enough. You know, Hmm. like don't pursue the arts. But my mom has always been very, very supportive. And she's like fourth generation. So like, it's like, like the difference of like, you know, a second generation father and a fourth generation mother, like understanding, you know, and I see that across the board of kind of like, you know, seeing whose parents are who. And I don't know, it's kind of something that we've all as like a society and a certain like culture have had to deal with, but I don't think is, hmm, it's not even a hundred years old. So it's hard to analyze and hard to really dissect, mm-hmm. you know, the, the ramifications of a decision, you know, like 80 years ago, like, you know, 70 years or 90 years ago like close mm-hmm. to it and kind of see how that takes its toll on like you know the children's children mm-hmm. you know and kind of what that does to like a whole group so so yeah yeah and you know it's it's so interesting because i i really don't think like i can't remember a specific experience with my grandparents or my parents where you know it was touchy to talk about the war or you know, like I, I know that I had family in the camps, yeah. but it's always been a relatively open conversation. So I've been That's, very lucky in that. Yeah, way. no, no, most definitely. Um, I think it's uh, it's primarily because because like I mean, how old are your, how old are your grandparents or how old are your parents? My parents are both. I don't know if they're they'll be happy with me saying this <laughs> on the internet, but they're both and they're uh, both sixty. Okay, yeah, my yeah. parents are both sixty as well. Mm-hmm. But then like my grandma's like. Uh, Sorry, Grandma Chris, but she's like 83, but she was only like four years old when she was in the internment camps. Mm. So you have no kind of real, real like idea of what goes on until afterwards. Right. right? But my great grandparents, they just didn't want to talk about it. A lot of people Mm. don't want to talk about it. Right. But what what about your, what about your grandparents? Like, you know, I feel like I I, I, I don't know if I asked enough questions when, when I could have. Uh Uh-huh. So that's 
that's probably why I don't remember anything super yeah. distinctive about it, but yeah. I probably didn't an- ask enough questions. Yeah. Um, but you know, this, you, you've, you mentioned like a few things that I really wanted to talk about sure. like from that. So first off the part about becoming farmers, like my grandpa on my mom's side, he, um, he lived in Huntington beach yeah. and he owned a nursery in yeah. Huntington beach. So they bought his land for super like dirt cheap and they were left with one house and like a block of maybe six, seven houses sure. named, of a street named after them, you know? Yeah. And it's like interesting that it's Huntington Beach now, where yeah. they're not really known for having an API hey. oh, or yeah. BIPOC community, you oh, know? Oh, definitely. And uh, so it was just, you know, it, that came to mind for me. But also, I, I asked around about you, Charles. Oh. Uh, huh. Before the podcast, I was just like, this guy Charles reached out. Like, like I don't know anything about him. So I, I reached out to like Sharon. I reached out to my friend Alan Hino. I was like... Alan. Alan. Oh, Alan from Punch Bears. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, like, tell me something about this guy, Charles. And he told me that he that you are also a torchbearer for Go For Broke. Yeah. So so for you to have, you said it, a great uncle, mm-hmm. a great uncle in the 442nd, and then to be a torchbearer, what what did that kind of mean to you, and what did it mean to your family? Um, I guess for my family, like, well, the person who brought me in was Nicole Cherry. She's a mm. former Nisei Week queen. And also that was, that was her grandfather, right? She wanted me to come in and kind of like help this youth group kind of like, I don't know, take charge in certain aspects. And for me, it was, it was great to like, kind of like learn much more about, you know, the 442nd and the kind of concepts and stuff they led, but it also kind of like painted this picture of like this young man, you know, going to war for his country, you know, despite what america did to his homeland and it's such a like it, it's so crazy to think about it because i know i know for sure i could say i i wouldn't be able to deal with that to be torn internally between your your homeland and your country and then sent off to war and i was just like wow like to to think like you know because i i only knew him as an old man and to see like to like think like you know this funny old man just like you know had such a a like enduring like 20 to 30s to to go through such trauma and to still be really chipper and and hitting on like the nurses at the old folks home like you know (laughs) it just I was like wow like he just has such a great like demeanor on it and he kind of spun it but like I imagine it's taken decades for him to kind of like really bring his guard down about things and realize like you know it's not it's not going to be the same, you know, uh, as, as it previously was. But I remember one of my friends telling me how, like, I guess her friend's grandma, like, was getting, like, dementia. And something that happened to her was that, like, she would, she would wake up in the middle of the night and start packing her clothes. And be like, they're coming. Oh, wow. we, need to, we, we need to leave. You know, they're coming. We need to leave. You know, and then because of that, like, she just, like, it, it brought back all those, like, super traumatic like instances and things like that but i'm just so glad like you know for for my uncle i think he just i think he passed away in his sleep but he was really happy till till the the very end Mm. and so was my great grandfather and my aunt and everyone else but yeah so bringing it back to like the torch bears it was just like it really made me like delve into it and kind of like see them as like younger people and to kind of like put myself in that position of time and their timeline to like really like think about it. And that's kind of where I started asking more about it because I was like, until I entered that group, I didn't realize like, oh, wow, this is such like a, a big and pivotal thing, you know, having the most decorated uh, regiment kind of like almost be snuffed by like American history, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I get what the torch bears are doing. They're trying to like really like push preserving that like story and kind of making sure that American people know it. And I think that's great for like the J community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it is funny or not funny. It's disgusting <laughs> that, <laughs> that they are literally right, the yeah. most decorated unit. And I'm like, and for like, 
a while ago, before I got really involved with like changing ties and Little Tokyo, I was like, they mean the most decorated of the JA units no. or something. No. No. no, it's like it's like it's it's unbelievable the way it's not discussed at all outside of Go for Broke and Little Tokyo. No, you know, yeah, it's it's really it's really weird. It's like I mean, mm-hmm. and those stories need to be told, you know, like unless we ourselves embrace them and we put them out there, like they're just going to be lost forever. So like mm-hmm. you know, with Mitch and his and the torchbearers, that's their main motive, you know, and then that's kind of like what I thought with like you know the music festival that I want to put on. I was going to be like, you know, you could have Far East Movement, G. Amazawa, Miyachi. You could have, you know, different other kind of ethnicities like Year of the Ox, like Ginger Root, things like that, just to cover all. Scarlett Japanese Johansson. Music. Is she, is she? <laughs> oh, oh no. you, want, you want to have her as like the lead singer of the Ghost in the Shell? Yeah, yeah. She, or she could just be she could just be like the MC. I don't know. She'll just be the Lost in Translation girl. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, there, there you go. There, yeah, you know we could we could see Milu or something like that, yeah. or what's his name, um, uh, Andrew Koji. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it's it it just it it's great to like kind of like know that like those kind of representations are out there because definitely I will say like you know for my dad or anyone else who do you look up to Bruce Lee. Jet Li, mm-hmm. Jackie Chan, like you don't, you don't have a lot, you know. Who's um, who's that one actress they put on a quarter now? Anime Wong. No, you I'm not familiar with this. You haven't collected that state quarter yet. Uh uh-uh. uh They put Anime Wong on a quarter, um, and she's huh. like one of the earliest, like I believe Chinese actresses, like in America. I swear. Huh. I it. I I saw it. I I got to collect them all. Pokemon. Um, uh uh-huh. You know. It, it was it was it was just like like it's great that we're getting noticed yeah but but it's like you know it's unfortunate that like we've been slighted for so many reasons you know it took this and, long and so yeah, much yeah 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 so like i mean i think that's my whole kind of like like point is that like you know i'm trying to help rebuild the confidence of a lost generation in a sense of like you know bring people together bring people for events welcome them into little tokyo with open arms just make sure they take off their shoes you know <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's, yeah it's 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 like <laughs> i want to share with everyone because if you look at the demographic of little tokyo it's not predominantly ja and to be honest like you could be japanese american and you could just not care about your japanese like heritage you could you could forever go on just you know rooting for the Lakers and like, mm-hmm. you know, the Dodgers and just not have any like affiliation. But yeah. for the people who do care, I think it's important that we embrace them. Like one of the professors that are about both of the professors actually who are coming to my screening, they're both not Japanese Americans. You know, I know a guy from my bonsai um, master's class that he, he does the, uh, the, 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 the shuchihachi, the, the, the bamboo flute. And he practices under, um, you know, his teacher in Japan, but he's, he's Caucasian. So it's like, like, like we, we, we still need to support those kind of people because they really embrace our culture. And honestly, they'll be the ambassadors for it, you know, wherever they go. Yeah. And I think that's much more important kind of moving forward um, because, you know, what, what's the parameter for Nisei Week Queens? They have to be half? I actually don't even know. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I heard of a new word. I thought it was funny because, you know, people who are half are hapa. Well, people who are quarter are quapa. <laughs> so, so I was like, I was like, I was like, wow, that's a, that's a thing, you know, <laughs> because we're all, we're all just being integrated and stuff. Uh-huh. So, I mean, quapa. I think I, I, <laughs> I didn't make up the word. I, I understand. It's okay. I understand. <laughs> it's it's great, but I mean, uh-huh. there, there'll definitely be more of us. I mean, like my kids yeah. will probably be Quapa, so mm. it's fine. But yeah, but yeah. So okay, I, I want to <laughs> ask you about your podcast, but before then, oh. I, I want to end with a little bit of my point of view on the optimism of Little Tokyo moving forward. Through I played in N Hoop. It's the 
AAPI basketball league that was at the Badocon over the summer. Cool. Uh, it's like it's similar to FOR, but it's like an adult league, mm-hmm. uh, standing for in honor of our parents. And through that, through my work at Changing Tides, mm-hmm. and just mainly those two things, I'd say, but I, I'm learning of plenty of young folks, Gen Z, millennials, who are passionate about culture, preserving mm-hmm. Little Tokyo, uh, the history of the JA community, the history of a, uh, Japanese history, yeah. and preserving what is Little Tokyo and then advancing it forward. I think there is a lot of reason for optimism that little tokyo won't just fade away once the current generation of of leaders go so i i I remember when i first got got hired at ltsc i had this concern that once the current folks running ltsc are gone i don't know if we have enough folks of our age range that would carry out carry it on but over this last year of working at little tokyo I have gained so much more confidence that folks like yourself will, there's more than just us here talking, you know, there's other folks that are going to fight for preserving JA culture. So I think, I think there's reason for optimism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say like, it's important to get those people like the right tools yeah. and to have them meet, you know, the people they would eventually be like, uh, successing mm-hmm. and kind of like I think that's the that's definitely the, the step up I have in terms of like other people just entering the space though is like they don't have any connections they don't know who's who they don't know like what avenues or who to contact for like you know closing off streets for events and stuff like that yeah and that's kind of like all the tools that my grandma has kind of given me because the people who are running Little Tokyo now they were just starting off when my grandma was kind of doing her organizations and stuff like that. So I see it as like, we need to like unify those groups of individuals who really, really care and give them the tools to succeed instead of like, you know, either have, you know, the red tape or the gatekeeping or kind of being like, Hey, like don't change these things. And I think that's like what I'm trying to inspire is like we should start newer events because I mean like you have like was it Kristen Fukushima who does like Haunted Little Tokyo that's super big you have Corey Hayashi who was like hey let's do a gyoza eating competition who was kind of like almost wasn't able to pull it off um, because of like you know how Nisei Week is structured and stuff like that but it went on successfully for um, several years and I think it's just about embracing the new ideas of the younger group and generation because let's face it in the past two years little tokyo was like nearing a deathbed it i think the people up top realized their mortality and kind of saw that like hey the only way to preserve this is if we get a lot more younger people and kind of give them the path to success Mm -hmm. give them our recipes so they don't have to fuddle around in the kitchen so much you know mess with ingredients and kind of figure things out so that's actually really um kind of like a a positive note to to leave off on in terms of Mm -hmm. like you because because you're definitely in touch with like you know like working there and then the other organizations and stuff i'm just like this like mercenary that walks around and just kind of like picks and chooses things i don't know i mean shoot man you're talking about giving the tools i mean i've been around for for the last year and how come this is the first time we're talking bro did i re- <laughs> did i not reach out to you and be like Yo, you did let me let me on the pod i don't you did what, what, what you what, did what reach this? out but it took you a I, year that's all i'm I saying i mean i've actually it's only been since uh it's only been since like june that i've been doing this okay yeah okay so like you all know right. so you know you, man, no we're here now we're here now my, we're here my, now. my free trial is not over all okay, right, you're right. I, before I have to right. put my credit card. You're you know? right. You're I mean, right. I, bro, I we're here you, now. I got you we're on the now. panel. I got you on All the right. panel. Did, did you? I know. Did, did you accept that? Yes, I'm there. Oh. So once it comes up, just anyway. Be, <laughs> I, I can't even think about that yet because because it's all good. yeah, I need I need to know more about the podcast that 
Uh, I'm it being interviewed on tomorrow. So if you could you getting, tell me, are you, are, are me, you getting nervous? Is this you getting nervous? No. I'm trying to. I'm trying to let you plug your podcast. Oh, so no, no, if no. you could tell a little bit about you. what your show is. Uh, so my podcast is called Dipped in Nonsense. Um, we started, or I was brought on, in uh, what is it, September of 2019, and we kind of just like carried on every week uh, through the pandemic, through all the craziness and stuff like that. But on the end of it, we kind of like started focusing more on like entrepreneurs and kind of creatives and stuff like that. And people who are, you know, making moves in their communities and who are like exerting a positive change because we feel that like talking to those people and giving them a platform is like huge because what bigger audience do you have than the internet, you know, than Spotify, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's trying to do their wrapped up. I hope to be in someone's like, podcast top five you know totally um but yeah like we're just trying to give a lot of opportunity and honestly as i'm segueing into like the ja community like i know i'm having you on tomorrow i'm having uh kintaro from uh who painted the mural uh, in weller court he's coming on next mm. week and then sometime um soon i'll have chris ono he's like the resident chef at hanse so i'm trying to like you know one build build pillars you know in the real world and in the metaverse you know try to get everyone involved but totally. i mean anyone's welcome you know if you can give me kristen fukushima's contact i've been meaning to reach out to her shout out if she listens to this you know <laughs> but like i mean it's just anyone and everyone i'm 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 an open door and sure. i think that's like how i envision little tokyo is just being like hey like if you want to come and join, you know, I'm here because, you mm-hmm. know, like, um, what is it? It's like, you can go fast by yourself, but you can go far together kind of thing. Right. So totally. I, I really want to like, you know, raise the tides so that, you know, all the boats come up. I don't know what the, the correct uh, saying of that is. I'm a member of Changing Tides, and I don't know the exact quote either, but I Got know it. what you're saying. Yeah. Got it. You know, we'll, yeah, just, yeah. we'll, just, we'll just keep saying it till yeah. it feels good for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, no, most definitely, man. Yeah, but I'm excited. Uh, so I don't know when yours will be coming out, but I'm sure they will be coming around the same time. Um, but um, I have some little just silly goofball questions. But before sure. then, is there anything you'd like to say before we jump into that? Um, let me just say, um, let me just plug my screening uh, on January 21st, uh, 2023, um, Little Tokyo Service Center and um, and the Budokan are collaborating and bringing Weathering With You uh, as an anime screening in uh, traditional Japanese with English subtitles. We have sponsors uh, by Cafe Dolce, Buttery Popcorn. Hopefully Chris Ono will, will do the hot bar. I don't know. He's making uh, curry hot dogs or something like that. And then we also have um, a rounded out panel. So far, we have three confirmed people. One is Jonathan Hall, who is my anime and manga teacher uh, from Japan. Um, Ken Provencher, who is a Japanese cinema PhD professor at LMU. And then we have yours truly, you know, the host of Changing Tides, Matthew Yonamura, who is going to round out the, the panel because of his film expertise and everything. You know, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad, honestly, I'm, I'm glad, uh, I like kind of like found you and then I could, you know, kind of integrate you in because I'm all about making opportunities and making lanes for people because, you know, the more you see, the more you can be. Uh-huh. So anyone who's looking to enjoy some anime, some food, we're probably going to have gift bags and other things uh, from our sponsors. Um, please come out on January 21st, 2023. I'll be sending out the flyers soon. Probably put them in the window sills of like, you know, different establishments and stuff like that uh but yeah i hope to see all of you guys there definitely and i'll do my best to make you look good and Thanks. not sound dumb next to your other panelists uh it's, it's, uh, all good. <laughs> it's all good. But, it's about- for sure um so i have some of these silly questions first cool. one being if you could invite five people to dinner dead or alive who would they be five people five people Dang, I don't know. Dead or alive? 
Yeah. Dead or alive. Oh, I wouldn't even know. I mean, like, maybe who would be a good uh, – Hayao Miyazaki, if I could, like, you know, fully understand Japanese, could fully understand – you know, I, I, have to, I have to go through a rigorous course. Maybe, like, Hideo Kojima, mm. uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, the guy who uh, runs uh, Nintendo – um i'd really like to talk to my great grandfather you know he could he could kind of round it out he, he wouldn't he wouldn't know too much about video games though uh-huh. and then akira kurosawa yeah very cool very cool yeah. uh what is your current go-to restaurant in little tokyo my current go-to restaurant in little tokyo huh i mean to be fairly honest, I don't know if I'm gonna blow up my spot, but like, well, dang, there's a couple. What am I going for breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Let's call it lunch. Dinner. Um, I don't know. All right, I'm gonna blow it up. Oh, I would say Hachioji. Hachioji has a really good chicken ramen that just like reminds me of like the Campbell's kid who's like in the snowman. <laughs> and he like walks up, but it's the Japanese version, so it's a bowl of ramen noodles, and like it's got like the best like chicken broth, okay. and their kima curry is like amazing. It's just like that and this, it's like a complete like set. For sure, and that's good. But then yeah, but if you're looking fancy, go to Aze. Oh, I I so, yeah okay. Yeah. I that's yeah. that's actually on my my like to go like oh, yeah? to do yeah yeah. I mean because yeah. that that. The, the I saw owner. Him yeah. What's what's uh what's uh what's his son's name? I forget his name. Dang. Um. But the the father is basically a culinarily French trained chef, and then now he's kind of doing his like wow. spin because he apparently had a a restaurant in Pasadena that had like three hundred seats, insane, like massive. But then I don't know that kind of like tuckered him out, and then huh. he kind of is like has a small shop. But huh. yeah. But but that's where I'd go to lunch, and that's where I'd go to dinner. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, if you were a raindrop, where would you fall? Oh, I've heard this one. So like, I got I got I got two for you. One, if I really didn't want my life to last long, Death Valley. Two would be Mount Everest, because then I could live forever. That's fun. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. If you were an ice cream flavor, what would you be? Oh, an ice cream flavor. Dang. I'd be... Specifically? Dang, that's kind of hard. I'd be... I'd be Brambleberry Crisp from Jenny's ice cream. Oh. Yeah, because I'm like... I'm like seasonally fruity. Got like (laughs) a, a pastry flavor. And I round it out with like, you know, the basic vanilla. In, in some aspects so you very know. good very good uh you did ask me to go to a smash bros event on <laughs> monday so who is your smash bros main oh are we talking like melee ultimate or brawl let's go ultimate okay so in ultimate they actually like i just wanted to watch but they ended up making me play mm-hmm. and i i really don't have like a main so i i i much prefer like street fighter so I was playing as like Ryu and like Terry Bogard. And they were like, they're like, who what is this? And then they're like, they do so much damage. Like, who plays as these characters? I'm like, honestly, it's great because I can do all the button inputs uh-huh. and I just like go at it. But if I had to pick like one of the original or the usual cast, it's like Duck Hunt Dog and mm. um, what is it? What's the inkling and then Marth? Like okay. those are my those are my like go-to Nintendo characters. Ever since, what was the the normal Wii one? Please forgive me. I know it's a dumb. I think it's Brawl. Brawl. That was Brawl, right? Melee was. Melee is like the the GameCube, the super fast one. Right. Everyone's all like sweaty and just kind of (laughs) like fire CCTV. Ever since Brawl, my my main has always been Ike. Ike had a super like solid moveset. And like, Uh honestly, like the reason why like Nintendo characters are so like, are so iconic is because of the silhouette. They, mm-hmm. they they show sure. you like you know like how he looks and the way he's structured he's got a big old cape and a big old sword but he's like 
every other anime spiky haired dude. You can't forget about the voices though. Like 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 True. like Chris Pratt as Mario is iconic. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it will be iconic. Oh, you know? But not in I, a good way. I mean I'm well, looking, okay. Wait, I'm, we're getting I'm, so off track. <laughs> Uh, what would the title of your autobiography be? Uh, of my, of my autobiography, uh, I think it would have to be, oh, he's so umptious. Okay. Yeah. True that. True I, don't, that. I, don't, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I was. I was thinking your festival what, name would have been good too. What my festival name? Your the festival name you came up with. We can't all be doctors. Oh yeah, I mean that's actually yeah sure. I mean that that, that works too. Either one, either no, one. No, I mean yeah. I you know what I I planned that for my festival. I okay. didn't think my autobiography, but I, I like see this is why you're you're my co-signer. You're you're my my co-writer. You just you know you're like you 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 get the edit and you're like ew, that's, <laughs> that's not uh, that's not gonna sell. You know, no, no, no one, no one in their, uh, what is it? Scholastic book orders is going to pick that book. You know? <laughs> Send it well, back. you know what? We, we have more, we, we have more time to brainstorm when I Definitely. come on your podcast tomorrow sure. and with whatever other conversations we have in the future. Cool. But, um, Kevin, of uh, dipped in nonsense of little Tokyo of go for broke. Yeah. Of you can't all cinema. be doctors of Budokan cinema. Budokan cinema. It's been great. Uh, we'll tag everything in the description and awesome. uh, I'll literally see you tomorrow. I will literally see you tomorrow. Bring I bring, bring your sticks. No, you don't play you don't play Smash Bros. on, on a GameCube controller? No, I play on the Wii Wii remote. <laughs> now, you do the, the motion? motion? No, I, but you'll no, see. No. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Much respect. Much respect. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Let's go. bring, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I play with the steering wheel. It's all good. You know? <laughs> okay, I'm ending the recording. This is Anyways, crazy. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah. I really appreciate you having me on. For sure, man. I'm glad for sure. had a good time. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you again to Kevin for joining the podcast and talking about his passion for Little Tokyo, his mental health story, uh, Super Smash Bros, and so much more. So uh, I love this episode, and if you enjoyed it too, you, you can subscribe to our show for episodes that release on every other Tuesday, and give us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. If you would like to support our podcast and help us grow, you can do so with a donation to the link at the bottom of the episode description. To hear more about Changing Tides, follow us on Instagram at LTSC underscore Changing Tides, or check out our website, thechangingtides.org, Let's continue to change the tides on mental health. Yeah, yeah.